leading us in prayer as we seek to worship our great God in heaven. Would you please uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me in them to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. Mark, chapter 15. It's good to be back with you. I, we were gone last week visiting uh, family and friends in Port Perry where I was preaching. And uh, I was hoping that, you know how there's usually a break? We weren't really on March break, but you know, people go away for Florida, go to Florida or something on March break, and they, we hope and pray that they bring the warm weather back. And for some reason, the exact opposite showed up this past week. And I'm, I'm looking forward to summer. I don't know how many of you are. Uh, spring and summer is around the corner. We like summer for all sorts of things, but particularly because we can take the girls outside and go ride bikes and go to the park. And one of the things we like to do is, is go to the zoo. Uh, do, have you been to the Toronto Zoo before or any zoo? It's kind of, you like the zoo? I like the zoo. The zoo's great. Um, we like going to see the elephants and tigers and bears and giraffes and penguins, you know, all sorts of fun, exotic animals. Do, do you know there's one exhibit at the zoo that I never really want to take the time to go see? Do you know what that is? The raccoons. <laughs> Did you know they have a raccoon exhibit at the Toronto Zoo? Raccoons! To me, that's just nuts. Do you know why? Because there's nothing special about raccoons. Like, I've got raccoons in my backyard. I don't need to pay 40 bucks to go to the zoo to see raccoons. I've got them in my backyard. There, there's nothing special about raccoons. There's nothing unique. They're a dime a dozen in Canada, aren't they? Like, you see them out at the dumpsters at work and by the garbage at the end of the street. Like, there's nothing special about raccoons. And therefore, because there's nothing special about raccoons, they're not unique, they're not worth my time. They're just not worth my energy. They're not worth my attention. I do not go to the zoo to see the raccoons at all. And to boot, they're in the Canadian exhibit, which is like five miles away from the rest of the zoo. They're really not worth your time. Well, some people uh, look at Jesus the way that Canadians look at raccoons. It's not very special. There's nothing all that unique about Jesus. Sure, the Bible's got some neat stories about him, but he's really not all that different from other people, from other quote-unquote saviors or messiahs or holy men. There's nothing unique about Jesus, and therefore he's not worthy of my attention. As we've been working through Mark's gospel, Mark has done the exact opposite of what people often do with Jesus. He has emphasized the fact that Jesus is unique. Jesus is different. And because Jesus is different, he is therefore worthy of your attention, worthy of your devotion, worthy of your everything. So let's read together Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. This is what Holy Scripture says to us today. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Jesus will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that it was in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is God's holy word, and we give thank to, thanks to him for his scripture. Would you please bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Father, we come before you today as every day as a weak and needy people. We confess we we often think that we've got our lives all sorted out and we're reminded 
in your word. And we're reminded day by day that, that we really don't. So Lord, we ask for your help this morning. Help us to depend on you. Lord, we, we give you praise and thanksgiving for the way that you have provided for us in the past, personally and corporately. We give you thanks for, for the many ways that you have provided, not just financially, but spiritually over these past few days and weeks and months, Lord. And we recognize that if it were not for you, we would have nothing. We would have, we would have no building. We would have no church family. We would have no, no ability to gather together if it were not for you. And Lord, you give us all that we need. You provide us with our daily bread. So Lord, help us to ask and help us to be thankful. Lord, I want to pray for, for one particular thing. Lord, many of us were made aware of an attack that happened in Moscow over the past few days. And Lord, we pray for the families, the, the, the individuals, the people that have been impacted by, by that attack. Lord, I confess, I, I don't really know much about what went on, and I don't really know all the details, but we are grateful that you are a king who sits on the throne, who sees all and knows all. And Lord, so even though we don't know what's going on, we pray that in this, through this, you would work in such a way where people would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for, for that nation. We pray for the leader of that nation. And Lord, we pray that, that your spirit would move in such a powerful way that he would open up your word in such a way that the gospel would be heard, that through this tragedy, people would be, would be forced to turn to you, the only rock, the only hope of, of peace and salvation in this life. I pray that you would, you would use even such a tragedy as this and that you would be pleased to call sinners to yourself. Lord, as we come to your word now, we pray that you'd do the same. Open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Give us hearts that would desire to obey. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You don't need to be worried. I know I was away last week. And I haven't forgotten that we looked at this passage a few weeks ago. So don't worry, I'm not losing it. Well, I may be losing it for other reasons, but not, not for that reason. Why are we coming back to this passage? If you were with us a few weeks ago, you will have noticed that we, we read this passage and we already looked at it. And we saw a few weeks ago that, that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough in his sacrifice. The curtain was torn. Way, entryway was granted to the Father, to God, because his sacrifice was enough. And because his sacrifice is enough, his sorrow is also enough in the sense of, Jesus is enough for me. Jesus knows exactly what I'm going through, what I've walked through. He's gone through it all and far worse. And Jesus is enough before the Father, and he is enough for us. So why, why are we coming back to this? Well, for one, because we, I just barely skipped over, barely made mention of verse 39, the last verse that we read a few moments ago. And because when we stop and, and zoom in on verse 39... We, we realize that there's, there's often a lot of confusion that's actually surrounding that verse, surrounding that saying, surrounding what the centurion has to say about Jesus, truly this man was the Son of God. And there's a lot of confusion um, surrounding this verse, this phrase, because usually what we end up doing is we, we don't let the Bible speak for itself. We bring our own ideas, our own presuppositions, our own understanding, and we say, okay, so, so I think I know what this phrase means, or I think I know what this verse means, and I'm going to shove my understanding into this verse. And sometimes we're right. Sometimes we, we actually get it right. But oftentimes, because we don't let the Bible speak for itself, we end up going down a track that the author didn't actually intend. What does the phrase, Son of God, mean? Many of us have heard it. We sing it in many of our songs. We confess that Jesus is the Son of God. But what does it mean? And what does it mean when it's applied to Jesus? To answer that question, 
we've got to actually ask, how does the Bible use this phrase? How does the Bible use the phrase Son of God? Because Jesus isn't the only one in the Bible that's called the Son of God, right? Who else is called a Son of God in the Bible? Adam. Adam's called the Son of God in Luke chapter 3. There's the genealogy of Jesus, and it goes all the way back, the Son of, the Son of, the Son of, and it gets to Adam, who is the Son of God. Well, who else? Hugo, you had your hand up. You're being so polite. Christians, yeah, Galatians. Paul calls Christians sons of God. Uh, The Bible also calls angels sons of God, right? In the book of Job, the sons of God gather before God in heaven, before the throne, and that's when Satan comes in and he does his sneaky thing, and then the book of Job happens, right? Israel is also called the son of God. This is my son. Um, Moses, when you go before Pharaoh, you will tell Pharaoh to let my son go, meaning Israel, the people of God. So what does the phrase son of God actually mean? If it can be applied to an individual or groups of people and Jesus, what does this actually mean? In what sense are, are these people in the Bible actually sons of God? Well, when we, we take the time to actually kind of process each and every verse in each and every section, I won't do that for you this morning, but what we see is when we study this stuff, we find out that to be called a son of God is to convey a sense of uniqueness. There's something different about this individual or this group compared to other people. So in some sense, Adam is different than every other human being. Why? Why? Because God spoke him into existence and formed him from the dust. You didn't come about that way. Why are angels called sons of God? Because they are in a category entirely different and unique from Job and from his three friends and from his wife, from humanity. They are in a category all on their own. Well, what about Christians? Well, Christians are unique not because they are better people or more intelligent people or because they have more money or because of anything like that. What distinguishes Christians from every other human being on the planet? They are in a special, unique relationship with God. And that unique relationship comes with salvation, comes with heaven, comes with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, to quote Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. So when we look at the Bible, when we look at this phrase, son of God, we don't automatically assume that when the Bible calls Adam the son of God, that he is, that it's talking about deity, that Adam is actually God. The phrase son of God doesn't automatically convey deity, divinity, oneness with God. It doesn't automatically do that. We're just simply meant to see that Son of God communicates something unique, something different. So that's how the Bible uses it. And then we want to ask the question, what does the centurion mean when, Jesus, when he calls Jesus the Son of God? If that's how the Bible uses it, is the centurion using it in that way? My guess is, is that he's not well steeped in the Old Testament. Don't know, doesn't say. But the likelihood of this Roman centurion who was posted on guard to oversee the execution of prisoners, he is not a Jewish scholar. He is not attending the synagogues, and he is not understanding this biblical theology of the son, sonship when it comes to God. So what does he mean? Well, when we look at this verse, verse 39, I think what we see is, is that he too is also saying that Jesus is different not with the same categories that we understand when we read the Bible, not because he has a rich biblical theology, but he is also saying that Jesus is different. Because Jesus is the Son of God, he is different. He is unique. There is something about him that makes him unlike everyone else. He calls Jesus the Son of God, as we see in verse 39, because he witnesses the way that Jesus, is, Jesus dies. So it's his death that sparks this, right? In verse 39, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, 
truly this man was the son of God. When he saw that in this way he breathed his last, what does that mean? When he saw that it was in this way that he died. When the centurion witnessed everything going around, going on around the death of Jesus, he was moved to speak this type of phrase, surely this man, truly this man was the son of God. His death impacts him in such a way that he had never been impacted before. Because this is a centurion, right? He's standing guard over the execution of criminals. He has likely witnessed dozens, maybe even hundreds of deaths before, right? But only when Jesus dies does he say, this man was the son of God. I don't think this was like his closing phrase every time somebody died. You know, there's sometimes like an, an ending phrase at an execution, thus the will of the Lord has been fulfilled or something like that. I don't watch too many executions, but sometimes they have like a closing phrase, we're done, this is over. I don't think this is a phrase that's just signifying, this isn't something that he says at the end of every execution. There is something different about this man, about this death, in a way that he's never been impacted before. What's different about this death? Well, as we read through these verses that I just read through a, a few moments ago, look in verse 33. What's different about this man's death? Well, in verse 33, there's, there's this unnatural darkness that just sets over the land for three hours. Inexplicably, there's darkness that covers the land. And we looked at what that meant and signified theologically a few weeks ago. What else does he see? Well, in verse 34, he hears Jesus cry out, but not just a cry of anguish, not just a cry of pain. He cries out in a, in a religious tone. He cries out in religious anguish. He cries out to his God. Jesus cries out to the God of Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then in verse 37, Jesus cries out again. He utters a loud cry. And, and it's interesting that Mark would record that because Jesus has been hanging on the cross for how long, roughly, at this point? Six hours. Since the third hour, which is 9 a.m., my clock is backwards, so 9 a.m., and he's been hanging on the cross, and then the darkness came at 12, and now it is now 3 p.m., three hours of darkness, and Jesus has been on the cross for six and usually when people hang on the cross, they lose their energy. They lose their strength. And that is certainly what happened to Jesus. But what happens right before people die? They die because they just slump over. Their body gives out. They have no strength. They have no energy to do anything, let alone utter a loud cry before they die. So all of these things, the centurion has put together and he's going, something's going on here. Something's different about this man because this death experience, what I'm witnessing right here, this has never happened before. I've never seen these kind of things. Jesus dies differently. And he dies differently because things aren't as they appear. Jesus is different because the circumstances of the cross aren't as they appear. What is... What does the story of the cross say to people as they walk by? Is it a story of victory or defeat? It tells a story of defeat. It tells the story that this one hanging on the cross is a failed insurrectionist. It tells the story that this man hanging on the cross, he is an unsuccessful savior. Whatever the Jews thought of their Messiah, this guy ain't it. He doesn't seem to be doing a very good job as king. We looked at a few weeks ago that how everybody thought Jesus was quite simply a loser. And that's what the story of the cross says. This guy has failed. This guy has not been successful. That's what the cross says. The cross just screams defeat. And yet, appearances can be deceiving, can't they? I mean... You've probably got examples running through your mind now where an appearance proved to be deceiving. Jesus is not like these two criminals that are hanging beside him. He's in a category entirely different than those two men who die beside him. He doesn't die as a common criminal. In fact, Luke's gospel records that the centurion also says, surely this man was innocent. 
He pieces all these things together and he hears the, the murmurs of the crowds and the murmurs of the Sanhedrin. He overhears what, what Pilate and Herod have been saying about Jesus and, and he sees everything and he puts it all together and he goes, this guy doesn't deserve to be here. He sees that this man is different. This man is unique. This, this story isn't as it appears. In fact, he says, truly, truly this man. In other words, he says, here's the truth. I know that the cross tells one story, but, but here's the truth. This man is unique. This man is different from all the rest, from all those that have come before, from all those that have died, that I have witnessed. This man is different. This man is unique. So the Bible uses the phrase son of God to communicate uniqueness. There's something different about this individual or this group of people. And we actually see that when we look at the centurion's confession, he's actually using it in the same way, not with the same theological richness or depth that the Bible has, but he's communicating something different about Jesus as well. This guy's not the same as everybody else. This guy is unique. So the question for us is, in what way is Jesus unique? If that's how the Bible uses the phrase, and that's what the centurion is saying, how is Jesus unique? In what sense is Jesus unique? That's really what Mark's gospel has been about, right? I mean, I know we've been in Mark for a year and a half, over a year and a half. We're coming to the end. Next week, I promise we'll get to the end, okay? What has Mark been trying to show us? He's been trying to show us through all of the different ministry highlights that he has in his gospel, he's been showing us why Jesus is unique. He's been showing us the uniqueness of Jesus through his his unparalleled power, right? How many times have we seen Jesus do something that is quite frankly inexplicable and unexplained and miraculous? Jesus has fed thousands of people with a few small loaves of bread and some fish. He's healed everyone who has come to him, the lame, the blind. He's healed the bleeding. He's healed the deaf. He has healed everyone who's, he's cast out fevers. He's had, remember the the paralytic was lowered in through the roof. He healed him without batting an eye. He holds power over the body. He holds power over, over other miraculous things like over food. He holds power over nature. Remember he walks on water. And then he actually, he just, he speaks one time and the entire storm disappears. The wind and the waves quiet down. That Jesus has power over, over death. Remember the story of Jairus' daughter? Lord, come and, and save my daughter. You can make her well. He knows that Jesus has power over the body. But then on the way, they get distracted by this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And then you find out that, oh, a little girl has died. And Jesus says, don't worry. Come with me. And he goes into the room and he raises this little girl who is dead back to life. Jesus holds power over, quite frankly, everything. That's what Mark has been showing us. Jesus is different because he has, he has a power that nobody else possesses. Jesus is unique because of his unparalleled power. Jesus is unique because of his authoritative teaching, because of his, his self-possessed, his, his inherent authority. He, he doesn't refer to other rabbis. Most rabbis said, well, as rabbi so-and-so has said, or rabbi this guy, or this wise teacher has once said, and they draw in from other people or from other sources of wisdom, wisdom literature. What does Jesus do? He simply gets up and speaks. And he speaks in such a way as we read back in chapter 1. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority. And then Mark throws in this little, I think it's a little jab, as one who has authority and not as the scribes. The scribes who are the quote-unquote experts in the law, they know the scriptures, they know the Bible, they have massive portions of it committed to memory. They are the ones that everyone turns to in terms of understanding God's word. And Mark tells us that the crowds recognize that Jesus, he teaches in a way that not even the scribes can attain to. There is no one who teaches like Jesus. He's unique because of his power. He's unique because of his authority. And he's unique also, and this is interesting, 
And we didn't really notice it a ton as we work through the scriptures, through Mark's gospel. But Mark shows us that Jesus is unique because the unclean spirits are afraid of him. The demons tremble in fear when they are confronted with Jesus. Back in chapter 3, we saw that Jesus was casting out unclean spirits. And in chapter 3, verse 11, and whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. There's the demons that, the thousands of demons, the legions of demons that inhabit that one man in chapter 5. Thousands of them. And they come face to face with Jesus, the Son of God, and what do they do? They tremble and they fear and they say, Jesus, don't kick us out yet. Or if you're going to kick us out, send us to the pigs. Their fear, they're trembling before Jesus, and they're Their usage of that title, Jesus, you are the Son of God, or as they will say in chapter 1 and again in chapter 5, they will say over and over again, we know who you are. You are the Holy One. You are the Son of the Holy One. We know who you are. And when they confess this and tremble in fear, that tells us that Jesus is the Son of God in a way that no other Son of God can actually hold on to. Do the unclean spirits tremble before Israel? Do the unclean spirits tremble before Adam? Do they tremble before Christians? Not on our own. And yet, when they are confronted with this Son of God, they tremble in fear because they know that when He speaks, they must move. That at His word, they will be cast out, they will be destroyed. Jesus is unique. That's, every, that's what Mark has been getting us to see. Jesus is different. Jesus is unique, and he can do what no other human being can do. He can walk on water. He can raise people back from the dead. He does what no other human being can do because he, quite frankly, can do things that only God can do. Only God can strike fear into the hearts of the unclean spirits. That's something that only God has the power to do. Only God has the power to speak and have nature obey instantly. Have you ever tried yelling at the rain? Some of you may have been. I remember remember one time, uh, my grandfather was a missionary in Africa, in Malawi, for 15 years. He was back. It was the middle of January. I remember I was like eight years old. And it's just this big dump of snow. He's at his, we're at grandma and grandpa's house, this big dump of snow, and he opens up the door and he sees like five feet of snow outside and he just goes, I want to go back to Africa. I'm done with this snow. And he just, he's not, he wasn't cursing, but he just starts yelling, I'm done with it. I don't want this snow anymore. Some of you may have felt that this past week. I'm done. No more. Did it work when you yelled at the snow? (laughs) No. We can't stop the storm. We can't stop nature. We can't change the weather. But Jesus can with a simple word from his mouth. Only God has this kind of ability. Only God can forgive sins. Remember the paralytic? He looks at him and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees, the scribes get upset. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they're right. Only God can forgive sins, and yet Jesus possesses this kind of authority that only belongs to God. Only God can do these things, and yet Jesus does them all, because Jesus is different. He is unique. Mark isn't just showing us that Jesus is a kind of son of God, that he's just some kind of unique and different person. He's showing us that the type of uniqueness that Jesus has is unparalleled by any other person in the history of the world. He's not just showing us that he has a unique relationship with God that that Adam does, that no other human being does, or a unique relationship with God that the angels have that no other human being does, or that Christians have and and that non-Christians don't. He's not just showing us that Jesus has a unique relationship with God. He is showing us that Jesus is God. So that's why when we see that Jesus is the Son of God, it doesn't automatically convey deity. It doesn't automatically communicate, hey, this guy is God, 
Because other people are called the Son of God, and yet when it's attributed to Jesus, shown to us through the Gospels, his unparalleled power, his authoritative teaching, and the fact that demons fall down and tremble before him, everything builds us to this one point that, hey, this guy is God. Nobody else responds to this man unless he's God. Mark has shown us that that Jesus is unique in his life. He's unique in his ministry. He's doing things that only God can do. He's unique because he's God. And now as we, we circle back and come back to verse 39, now Mark is showing us that Jesus is unique in his death. Yes, he's unique in his ministry and what he can do, but he's still God in this verse. He's still doing things that only God can do. The cross doesn't end his godship, doesn't end his, his deity, And everything about his death is different. That's what the centurion sees, even if he doesn't understand it, even if he doesn't know how to put all these pieces together. He doesn't understand that darkness is is communicating God's judgment and God's wrath. He doesn't have all the Old Testament texts in his mind. He just sees all this stuff and he goes, hey, this is different. His death is different. And for us, we need to ask, what makes Jesus' death different? Millions of people die every year, right? I think I saw, I looked it up this past week, it was something like 61 million people died in 2023. And and that's not even counting the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of abortions that, that also took place. Millions of people die every year. They have, millions of people have died in the past and millions of people, should the Lord tarry and not come back today, millions more will die in this coming year. And yet not one single death that has taken place in the history of the world is like this death, is like his death, is like the way that Jesus died. But he wasn't just unique because of the method, right? It's not because Jesus died on the cross, that's what makes him different. Thousands of people died on a cross. And it's not because his death was extremely painful. Lots of people have died extremely painful deaths. It's not the mockery or the sorrow or the shame Many people have died being mocked and shamed. His death is unique. And this is what Mark has already helped us to see. So it's not found in verse 39. It's what's built us up to verse 39. His death is unique because he and he alone suffers for the sins of other people. He and he alone suffers under the wrath of God. He alone drinks that cup, that cup of God's wrath that no other human being could possibly hold. And and no one else can do it. No one else can die like Jesus, drinking that cup of God's wrath for other people because everybody else has their own sins to deal with. I can't die for your sins. I've got my own sins to pay for. Your parents, your children, even your best friends, your spouses. There is nobody else in this world that can pay for your sins because they have their own to deal with. But Jesus is different. Jesus has no sins of his own to pay for. And so he dies. He suffers for the sins of other people. But he's also unique because of of what his death accomplishes. He's unique because he suffers in the place of other people, something nobody else can do, But he actually does something with his death that, I mean, most of us would love our deaths to be meaningful. I love watching old war movies, and there's there's always that one guy who just wants to to make his death worth something. And what they'll often say is, after somebody's died, let's make sure their death wasn't worthless. Let's make sure that their death means something in the end. But we have no control over that. And quite frankly, our deaths, this may sound insulting to you, you and I are going to die and nobody's going to remember we will be forgotten. We, n- nobody, nobody will, we, we aren't going into the history books because our deaths do nothing. And yet when Christ dies, his death accomplishes something. It means something. It brings about the salvation of sinners. No one else can do this. Muhammad can't do this. Mary can't do this. We can't do this for ourselves. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. And there's nothing any other human being in this world 
past, present, and future could ever do to save us from our sins. Only Jesus can do this because only he is the unique son of God. Jesus is accomplishing on the cross what only God can do, what no other human being can do. He is accomplishing the salvation of sinners. That's what Mark has been leading us towards over the past year and a half as we've been walking through this. As we've gone through 15 chapters, Mark has been showing us over and over and over again, don't you see that Jesus is different? Don't you see that Jesus is unique? We get the confessions from from God himself at, at his baptism and at the transfiguration. This is my son. This is my son in a way that, that no one else has ever been my son. For God himself sent his son to die in the place of sinners, to save his people from their sins. I wrote a note in here, and I wasn't originally going to say it. It was just my transitional point, but I'm going to share it with you because I, I think it's helpful. Jesus is not a raccoon. You can see why I wasn't planning on saying that. That was my transitional. Jesus is not a raccoon. Raccoons are boring, they're ordinary, and they're a dime a dozen. There's nothing unique and nothing special about raccoons. Jesus is not a raccoon. He is unique, he is different, and he is accomplishing what no other human being has ever accomplished in the history of the world. Jesus is worthy of our time and our attention. You may walk past the raccoon exhibit at the zoo, you should not walk past Jesus. Do not bypass Jesus and fail to give him your attention. The question for us is, will you listen to Jesus? In Mark chapter 9, verse 7, the Father speaks from heaven and he says, speaking out of the cloud, he says, this is my son. Listen to him. Are you listening to Jesus today? I don't, I don't mean that in the sense of, are you trying to hear Jesus speak today? Jesus has spoken. Yes? Jesus has spoken. He has spoken loud and clear in his word, through his word to us today. Jesus has spoken. The question is, are we listening? And not just listening in the sense of, of I, I read the words. Listening isn't just hearing, it's obeying. He who has ears to hear, Jesus will say over and over and over again. The Pharisees were hearing, the scribes were hearing, the crowds were hearing. Everybody heard what Jesus had to say. And yet he's saying that there are those that hear and obey. Those that listen and pursue what he has said. Are you listening? Are you listening to Jesus today? Are you listening to this unique son of God Jesus has a command for every single human being in this room. Jesus has something for each and every one of us. And I'm not saying like Jesus has a particular verse for you and a particular verse for you. I'm saying that Jesus, particularly in Mark's gospel, what we've seen is he has a command for both Christians and non-Christians. He has a word, a message that we must all listen to and obey. So to the rebel to the self-sufficient sinner who wars against God's rule, God's way, God's authority in their life. What does Jesus have to say to them? You go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 15. What does Jesus say? Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's the command that Jesus begins the gospel with. That's where it starts. You're a sinner and you're bound for hell. Repent and believe. Stop running, stop fighting, stop warring against God, lay down your arms and come to him in faith, turning from your sin and turning to him by trusting in him. And you will receive forgiveness of your sins and you will receive open arms, welcomed into the kingdom of God. Believe the good news and you will be saved. That's the word he has to the rebel. That's what the rebel sinner must listen to and obey. And then to the saint, to those sinners that have been saved by grace. How do you summarize an entire gospel account in a few words? 
think we go back to the words that Jesus says in chapter 8. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. That's what you're called to do today and every day. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. This is what we've seen throughout Mark's gospel, isn't it? Jesus has been emphasizing, he's been taking times with his disciples over and over and over again, privately, publicly, when the Sanhedrin are there, when he, they're alone on a boat, when they're, wherever they are, what is Jesus teaching them? Here's what it means to be my disciple. Here's what it means to follow me, to love me, to be devoted to me. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be a Christian, you are, you are called to pursue humility, to pursue love, to pursue joy, to pursue holiness and righteousness, to pursue God's way, not your way. Jesus teaches his disciples to put others first. Stop trying to be the best. Stop trying to be the greatest. Stop trying to be first in line. The first shall be last. And if you would be first, you must be slave of all, servant of all. Put others before yourself. Don't try to get ahead. Depend on God. Remember we saw that the disciples, Jesus comes off the mount with, with the, the three disciples and there's the, the rest of the disciples are struggling with, with casting out this demon. Lord, why couldn't we cast it out? Why were we struggling? We've done this before. Well, they failed because they failed to depend on Jesus. They failed to depend on God. They started depending on themselves, their own strength, their own abilities. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. As you pursue life with me, walking with me, as you pursue true discipleship, don't ever for a single second begin to think that you can do this on your own. Depend on me. And then that question he received from the scribe, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What does it mean to listen to Jesus today? What does it mean to listen to this unique, different, only Son of God? It means to love God with all your heart. It means to love God with all your soul. It means to love God with everything that you are. It means to love God and love your neighbor. Put others before yourself. This is what it means to to listen. This is what Mark has been trying to get us to see. Don't you see Jesus is different? And don't you see that because Jesus is different, you must listen and obey? Are we listening to Jesus? We can ask that personally, and we ought to do that. You ought to ask, take a few seconds in in your own heart and go, am I listening to Jesus? Am I following his commands? Am I doing what he has called me to do? But as a church, are we listening to Jesus? Are we pursuing the things that God has called us as a group, as God's people, as the body of Christ to pursue? Are we listening? Are we obeying Jesus today? Jesus is unique. He is God's son. He is the son. And we must listen to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks today that you have sent your son, your only son, to bear our sins on the cross that we deserve, to take our punishment from off of ourselves, to place it on himself, to die in our stead, and to give us, transfer to us his righteousness so that in him we might stand complete, stand holy and righteous in your sight. Lord, we give you thanks for the son of God today. Dear son, Help us to listen. Give us grace to listen to you today. Lord, as we've worked through Mark's gospel, we have seen time after time after time the ways in which we are called to listen and obey. And Lord, we confess we fail so often. So Lord, help us. Remind us each and every day of the glories of the unique Son of God so that we might be encouraged, spurred on to continue in faith even though the road may be tough. We give you thanks. We give you praise, glory, and honor. And it's in the name of our Savior, the Son of God, we pray. Amen.
Would you please stand as we close our time together with a, a hymn? Truly, his sacrificial death for our eternal life is significant for the insignificant. That's you and me. Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise and adoration, now and forevermore. Join us as we sing, Paris, Lord Jesus. Just a reminder, we've got our members meeting right after the service, so members, please don't scatter. Uh, grab your coffee and tea at the back, and please come back and sit down. We'll try to get started in the next five to ten minutes. It won't be a long meeting. Just close out some things from last year. Young adults, we have uh, our meeting this afternoon, four o'clock, up at uh, our place in Newmarket. So uh, if you are between the ages of 18 and 30-ish, I put the ish. We'll be loose on the ish. Please come see me afterwards, and we'll give you directions if you haven't been there before. Let's, but we'll spend some time this afternoon uh, fellowshipping together. And then just one note, um, there are other things. Please look in your bulletin. We have our Good Friday service coming up this Friday, 1030 a.m. here at the church. Please uh, make sure to come. Invite some family or some friends that maybe don't have anywhere to go on Friday, and we will spend some time reflecting more on the uh, death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me just close with a word of prayer. Lord, you are fairer than all that is in this world. We pray that you would help us to cherish you as we have just sung, cherish you above all else, to cherish you in our hearts and to set you as Lord and ruler in our minds. Guide us, we pray, by your spirit this week. Find us faithful, we pray. May you put opportunities in front of us and may you move in our hearts, convict us to take those opportunities to share the gospel this week, to share this good news that Jesus has come. He has died and he has risen to life again so that sinners might be saved from damnation. Lord, this is our prayer. We ask for your help in Jesus' name, amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.